If you've got your Bibles, you can flip open to John chapter 21, and we're going to be in verse 15. And that's, we'll be a few places today, but that's where we'll mainly be camped out. And so you can go ahead and flip there, John chapter 21, uh, verse 15. A couple weeks ago, I was in upstate New York, and uh, I preach a summer camp up there every summer. I've got a good friend of mine who runs the camp. Uh, his dad had, had owned it, and he went over to uh, take it over, and it's a really cool place because um, we get to speak to a lot of kids who haven't heard the gospel and who are from New York and different places. And, and New York is a great place, um, and no offense if you're from New York, um, but here's my thing with New York. I knew I was in a bad place when I asked for a sweet tea, and, and the lady said, we don't have sweet tea. And I thought, oh my gosh, like, like you people who've moved here from up north, like, we got to put a support group around you and say, welcome home. Like, you've come to the promised land of Tennessee. We've got sweet tea. We've got sugar and everything, right? And so, but I've been going up uh, to this camp uh, for a few years. And one year, Katie was with me. My wife, she's right here. And we decided that the camp's about three hours from New York City. And so, we decided we were going to tra- take a trip. Uh, we were going to stay an extra day and go to the city one year. And so we did uh, what, what you do when you're poor and don't have any money is uh, we bought some Megabus tickets. Um, let me just say, if you ever want an adventure, just buy you some Megabus tickets, right? That's a trip in itself. And so we hop on this Megabus, and there's all kinds of people from all kinds of different places and all kinds of stuff going on on this Megabus, and we get on this thing, and we drive into New York City, and it drops us off right in the middle of Times Square, and so we're trying to cram everything that we can do in one day. I mean, we're trying to see all the sights. We're, trying, we're going to Phantom of the Opera. We're trying uh, to go uh, to the memorial of where the World uh, Trade Center was. We're trying to see the Statue of Liberty from a distance. And we're doing all these different things. And at the beginning of the day, I'm feeling pretty good. And, and even more, I was in a park, found me a good hot dog stand, got me a hot dog, and I'm looking at the Statue of Liberty, and I'm feeling good. And I think I even have a picture. This is me. <laughs> What more do you need in New York? You know, I got my hot dog, I'm smiling, I'm feeling good. But I, I had caught something at the camp. I had caught a sickness at the camp. And, uh, and so I was trying to fight through it, and I felt okay in the morning. But all of a sudden, that sickness just began to just, uh, just come on me. And I began to feel worse and worse and worse till finally I was in Phantom of the Opera. And I'm like, I am going to die in, in, this, in this theater. The last picture they're going to have of me is with my hot dog, right? It's going to be in my obituary. It's my hot dog picture. And, and, and then New York City, let's just say this. We probably can all agree on this. It's probably the worst place that you can possibly be when you're sick, right? I mean, you're up there. There's people all around you, and they're making you mad. And you just want to punch them, and you don't have sweet tea. And I'm in my head, I'm just like singing, country roads, take me home to the place where I belong. Look at there. And so I'm just like, I got to get back, right? And, uh, and I'm like, I got to get back home. I got to get back home. And so I just tell Katie, I, bet, like, I, I get to the point where I'm about to fall over. And I just tell her, I say, you got to get us out of here. And she just looks back at me and she just says, follow me. Now, here's what I'll tell you about Katie. I like to call her uh, what I like to say, uh, redneck bougie. And so <laughs> here's what I mean by that. She's from the country, and, uh, and so they do Sunday, uh, Monday night dinners, family dinner, everybody comes. Like that great aunt, the great uncle, the cousin that you're like, who is it? Where'd he come from? Everybody meets for family dinner, right? And, and she'll go mudding. She'll do all this stuff. She's country, right? But she also likes nice things, and she likes the city, and she likes to dress up. So, and she can, she can command it with the best of them, right? I may get in trouble for this later. I'm sorry. It's for the kingdom. And so, <laughs> and so, <laughs> You can tell I've only been married a month. (laughs) And so I told her, I said, you got to get us out of here. And so she just looks at me and she just goes, follow me. Just follow me. And so literally, I mean, she's navigating us through the subway and yelling at people to get out of the way and getting us on different things, gets us all the way back to the megabus. We get on the megabus, go all the way back to the camp, and then the next day we fly all the way back home, and we made it back. But all I was focused on in that moment was just following her. Just follow her, follow her, follow her, because she had said, follow me. Here's what we're going to dive into this morning. Those two words, follow me. Those are two words that Jesus used all throughout the scriptures. That's what he used at the very beginning of his ministry when he calls his first disciples in Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 through 21, when Jesus calls two guys, Peter's one of them, he says what? Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And what do those guys do in that moment? It says they drop their nets and they immediately follow Jesus. When we hear that, we think, oh, that, that's a great story. That's, that sounds great. That sounds nice. They just dropped their nets and, and followed Jesus. But we forget in that moment that these guys were fishermen. Like, that's probably all they knew. 
That's probably the, that's how they made their livelihood. That was their job. That's what they were known as, was fishermen. And in that moment, when they dropped their nets and followed Jesus, they said, we're dropping everything. We're dropping the way we make a living. We're dropping all we've ever known. We've dro- we're dropping what we've been told how to do, and we're leaving it behind and following Jesus. We even see Jesus say it at other times to people. And even at times, he says it in a way where we think, man, Jesus, that, that was harsh. If you remember Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 62 says this. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you grow and proclaim the kingdom of God. And still another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. It seems harsh. They're saying, Jesus, I want to follow you wherever you go. And Jesus says, hey, you're not going to have any place to lay your head. Jesus, I want to follow you. Just first let me go back and bury my father. Let the dead bury their own dead. Jesus, I want to follow you. Let me first go back and say goodbye to my family. You can't have hands on the plow and be looking back. Maybe you remember the story of a rich young ruler in Mark chapter 10. It's in some of the other gospels as well. This guy literally runs up and falls at the feet of Jesus. And he says, Jesus. He falls down and says, Jesus, tell me how to inherit eternal life. I want to follow you. And Jesus says, keep, you know what the book says, follow all the commandments. The man says, I've done all these things. I've done this one, this one, and this one. And Jesus says, one thing you lack. He said, Jesus looks at the man and loves him and says, one thing you lack. He says, sell everything you have and then come follow me. What does it say? The man walks away sadly. I I want you to notice something in that story. That, That story, this rich young ruler, he's probably well known. He's probably known by everybody. He's known as the rich young ruler. This is the perfect moment for us to pull out the guitar and start strumming in the background. And, and then all of a sudden give the invitation and say, hey, follow Jesus. And this guy's coming and lead him to Jesus. And then it's a perfect moment for us to begin to show his testimony and share his testimony about this prominent guy who turned and followed Jesus. But instead, Jesus says, hey, sell everything you have, then come follow me. Why? Because Jesus knew that this man loved something more than he loved him. What was the point he was making to these other three guys? It was this. And when I say the words, follow me, you've got to be willing to leave everything behind you. I've got to be more important than your family. I've got to be more important than your home. I've got to be more important than your finances. I've got to be more important than everything in your life. And you've got to be willing, just like those fishermen did, to drop it all immediately and follow after me. I just can't help but wonder, myself included, if maybe just a little bit, especially in America, if we've started to cheapen the invitation by Jesus a little bit. I mean, Jesus says, follow me with everything that you are, drop everything, leave everything behind. I've got to be number one in your life, and you can't have anything else above me. Today, in John chapter 21, We're kind of going to focus on Peter and his life a little bit. And as we talk about this concept of following me as as what Jesus has given to all of us, I think Peter's a great guy to look at. And here's why. I think oftentimes Peter is like us. Man, Peter is quick-tempered at times, right? He's the guy who pulled out his knife and cut a guy's ear off when they came to took Jesus. Quick-tempered. Some of y'all are quick-tempered in this room today. Peter's the same guy that was a little arrogant at times. He was brash at times. He's the same guy that for a moment was walking on water with his eyes fixed on Jesus, and then a moment later was distracted and began to sink. How often in our life have we had our eyes on Jesus, and a little bit later we're focused on something else? Peter's the same guy that was a great success for Jesus at times, but honestly was a failure at times. If you remember, and what we're going to pick up today, just a few chapters before, we're in John chapter 21, but a few chapters before in John chapter 18, Peter's around a fire. And around that fire... He denies Jesus three times, claims that he doesn't know him, claims that he wasn't with him, claims that he didn't walk with him. This morning in John chapter 21, we pick up, let me just give you a little background. What's happened is Jesus has risen from the grave. This is the third time he's appeared to his disciples. And even so much so, when Peter recognizes it's him, he jumps out of the boat and begins to swim to the shore to, to, to be with Jesus. Jesus has prepared a breakfast. He's prepared a meal. 
And they begin to sit around this fire again. So a few chapters before, Peter's around a fire and denies Jesus. And now he's going to be around a fire, and Jesus is going to ask him three, three questions. And the three questions are all going to be the same. And this is what it says. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. So the beginning, when he first calls Peter, he says the words, follow me. And the third time he appears to Peter, he says the words, follow me. Quickly this morning, I want to give you a few points I believe we can take from the life of Peter and this story. And number one this morning is this, if you want to jot it down, is follow me as you are. Follow me as you are. See, I think the great news about this story about what we read about Peter around this fire with Jesus, is Peter has just failed Jesus. He just denied him three times. And I, I think all of us would admit, hey, I, I've been there before. Like, I've let Jesus down. I've failed him at times. I've messed up at times. I have failed Jesus at different points in my life. But the good news is, is Jesus isn't sitting here scolding Peter. Peter, how dare you? How, could you? how could you deny me? How could you mess up like that? How could you do that to me? Instead, he's given him the same command that he gave him at the beginning follow me. And even more, what I would tell you this morning is maybe all of us, if we would just focus on following Jesus as we are with all that we are, and he'll take care, of the, take care of the rest. Follow Jesus as you are with all that you are, and he'll take care of the rest. Think of this for a moment. What I love about this story is Jesus is going to pick his 12 disciples, and he didn't say, hey, I'm going to pick 12 disciples. One day I'm going to leave them, and they're going to change the world. So let me go pick out the brightest, the smartest, the most courageous, the strongest, the boldest. I'm not, let me go pick out the ones that society says, hey, this guy will be the best one for me. No, no. He goes to uneducated fishermen, and he says, follow me. And he, here's the reality in that. I don't think Peter had a clue all that Jesus would do through him in that moment. Peter didn't know. He didn't know that one day he would be the rock that Jesus builds his church on. In that moment, he just knew, hey, Jesus is telling me to follow him, and so I'm going to drop my nets and follow him. And here's the reality for all of us today. We don't know what God wants to do in and through us. We don't know all that he has in store for us. And if we did, we'd probably feel like we can't do that and we're not ready for it. And the great news is he's not asking you to do that. He's just asking you to simply make a choice. Follow me. Follow me today. Follow me tomorrow. Follow me the next day. Follow me the day after that. And watch me do all that I do through you. See, what I love about this as well is I think we forget sometimes the human aspect of this. And Peter's a guy, just I guess because he denied Jesus three times. But even when you look back through the Bible, and you look back at these characters we hear about, at times we can think, man, they, they were on another level. I mean, they were just, all these people were so different. But think about Noah, for example. Noah was a great man of God, and God decided to save him and rescue everyone. But when he gets off the ark, he gets drunk. He's human. Think about David, for example. David's the same guy who had the faith to stand before Goliath and take down a giant. But later on in his life, he commits adultery with Bathsheba and has her husband put at the front lines of battle to be killed. Think about Elijah for a moment. Elijah had the boldness to stand against 450 prophets of Baal and him by himself on Mount Carmel and call fire down from heaven. And God brought the fire down from heaven. But a little bit later, he's in the desert saying, God, just take my life. Think about Moses, for example. Moses killed a man. And even more, do you remember when Moses had a conversation with God in the burning bush, how many excuses Moses gave God? God said, Moses, I want you to go. God, I don't want to go there. How can I go there? God, I got a speech problem. God, I can't do that. Here's the beauty and all that. These, these were normal, normal people just like us who made a decision to follow Jesus. And even though they had bad moments and good moments, you know what they did after those moments? They followed Jesus. David repented. He got back on his feet and followed Jesus after that, after he got on his knees. Every single one of them. 
And the great news for all of us today is Jesus is looking at all of us and saying, just follow me as you are. Just make that choice. Number two that I want to give you this morning is follow me whatever the cost. Follow me whatever the cost. Look at what it says in verse 18 again. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Think about that for a moment. Jesus looks at Peter and says, you're going to die for following me. He basically tells, hey, you're going to die, now follow me. That's a big cost. Can I be honest? In my life right now, I'm kind of convicted that I don't, I don't know what I would do. In that moment. I would hope I would say, yes, Jesus, I'm going to follow you to the end of my life. But in that moment, that, that's a hard choice if we're honest. It's going to cost you everything in that moment. Peter said, I, I'll follow you. But I, think about the guys that we mentioned not long before. and Maybe you want to jot this stuff down too. Following Jesus at times will be a cost. And maybe you want to jot this down. The cost will equal being alone at times. The cost will equal looking crazy at times. And the cost will equal being in pain and persecuted at times. Think back on these stories for a moment. How alone do you think Noah felt as he began to go outside and build an ark? Hey, Noah, what are you doing? I'm building an ark. You're on your own on that one, Noah. Have fun. How alone? Do you think David felt as he walked before a giant who was a champion named Goliath that no one else wanted to fight? How alone do you think Daniel felt when they said, hey, don't pray anymore. We'll throw you in the lion's den. But yet Daniel got on his knees and began to pray at the same time at the, every day at the same place. How alone do you think Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego felt as everyone bowed down to this statue and three guys are left standing? You'll be thrown in the fiery furnace. We're going to stand. How alone do you think Elijah felt on Mount Carmel when there's 450 prophets of another God and he's all by himself? But all these guys, you know what? They had enough because they had Jesus. But even more, when you're alone, you know what you'll look? Crazy at times. Even more, Noah's out there building an ark. Why are you building an ark? God's going to send a flood and all these animals are going to get on the boat. You have lost your mind, Noah. Like you're, you're flat out crazy. David, you're a shepherd boy. You're crazy. You can't fight this giant named Goliath. Daniel, don't pray on your knees. Just pray in your head. Pray in your heart. Just walk around and keep praying. It's not worth being thrown in a lion's den to cost you your life. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, just bow down. Just come down. Don't, don't, don't uh, try to get thrown in a fiery furnace. You're crazy if you do that. Elijah, there's 450 over here and there's one of you. You're crazy. But you know what? Every single time, in those stories and in general, God came through. Man, follow and build what God tells you to build, no matter how crazy you look. Follow and let God take down the giants in your life. Follow and pray even when you're told not to. Follow and stand even when all else bow. Follow and, and, and tell the risen Savior just like Peter did, even though many saw him die in front of them. You know, the great thing about life is this. And what I get to do is I get to watch people in all kinds of different avenues and all kinds of different places. And some of you people, you're crazy. I'm just going to tell you. You know, and we go crazy at times. The other day I was driving, and I, I kid you not, I missed the arrow, the green arrow, by about two seconds. And the lady behind me was honking her horn and throwing up her hands, and I'm like, you've lost your mind. But I'm the same way at times. But, and, then, and then some of you, man, you've got a favorite team, and man, on Saturdays you're like me, I've got orange on, and I'm going crazy for the balls, and I don't care what I look like, I don't care what people think, I don't care if I'm alone, I'm shouting for the balls. And then some of you, you need to repent this morning. I'm a youth pastor, and I get to come watch your kids play sports. You lose your mind out there. I'm like, it's just a baseball game. Don't hit that guy. Don't ruin your witness, right? They go to a different church. They don't go with us, right? I mean, you go crazy out there. When's the last time we're that willing to look crazy for Jesus? We say, we don't, we don't care if we're alone. We don't care if people look at us like we're crazy. Here's an example for you. As a youth pastor, I've just learned that people are going to look at me like I'm weird no matter what if it's a 6th through 12th grader, uh, especially going into cafeteria lunches, right? I mean, there's no, way, there's no way to not be weird doing that, right? You walk around, you talk to random kids, you, you go to ball games and stuff, you're going to look weird. And so I've just accepted the fact I don't care what they think, right? And so this past Wednesday night, we had what we call a hillbilly hoedown. And I dressed up as Woody. 
And I decided to preach as Woody. Look at that. Woody's preaching. And, and as I was, I was preaching, I was like, I don't care what these 6th through 12th graders think. It doesn't really bother me. I don't care if I look weird. I don't care if I look crazy. It doesn't bother me at all. But can I be honest with you? In that moment, I didn't care at all. But earlier that day, I was at a middle school, and we were praying around the hallways. And as God placed different, there was t- some teachers in the building. And I got to be honest, in my heart, I was kind of scared to go over and ask them if I could pray over them. I didn't want to look crazy to go pray over them. I didn't want to look alone to go pray over them. I don't know where you're at, but maybe you have similar moments in your life, but I just want to be in the, in the moment where I don't care what people think because I love Jesus more. And if he tells me to go pray over someone, look at me like I'm crazy. God told me to do it. If he tells me to follow him to an unknown land, God, let me follow you to an unknown land because you've called me to do it and it doesn't matter what anyone else says. After the last service, a man came up to me and he had just come back from the mission field. And he said, God told me to sell everything that we have and move to China. And he said, you don't know how many people looked at me like I was crazy. But he said, that's what God told me to do. And so we did it. Let me just tell you something. The more I read this book, the more I find that following Jesus, we're going to look crazy at times. We're going to look alone at times. But Jesus didn't give us the option. He said, follow me. Follow me. Follow me. Lastly, what I want to give you this morning Number three is follow me. Oh, let me read this real quickly. I forgot. Maybe some of you have read this book. If not, I I recommend it. It's a great book. Uh, It's a book called Radical by David Platt. Uh, And it will convict you. And on page four, he's got a a section called Puddle of Tears. And this is what he says. He's telling a story about these church leaders gathered in a room in a different country. And this is what it says. Imagine all the blinds closed on the windows of a dimly lit room. Twenty leaders from different churches in the area sat in a circle on the floor with their Bibles open. (laughs) Some of them had sweat on their foreheads, and after walking for miles to get there, others were dirty from the dust in the villages from which they had set out on bikes early that morning. They had gathered in secret. They had intentionally come to this place at different times throughout the morning so as not to draw attention to the meeting that was occurring. They lived in a country in Asia where it is illegal for them to gather like this. And if caught, they could lose their land, their jobs, their families, or their lives. He goes on to share about how a man shares and says, I'm hurting. Because there's a cult that's taking members from my church, and they're known to cut the tongues out of people. And then he goes on to share about how there's a moment where there's a knock at the door, and they get afraid. I may misquote this a little bit, but they gather together, and they begin to pray so fervently and earnestly. And when they got up from praying, there was a puddle of tears on the floor. Listen, sometimes I'm convicted by that. Let me just ask you this question in your heart. You answer this. Is this what Jesus is calling us? If tomorrow someone said, hey... If you show up at Thompson Station Church on Sunday, you're going to be arrested. You can show up, you can believe in Jesus, you can follow Jesus, but we're going to throw you in jail. You're going to lose your land, you're going to lose your property, you're going to lose your family, you're going to lose everything that you have. What would you do? See, the hard part with that is Jesus didn't give us an option. He said, follow me with everything. Be willing to lose it all. Be willing to leave everything. Be willing to leave it all behind and follow me, no matter the cost. No matter what lies behind, no matter if it, even if it costs you your life. Number three this morning is follow me with all of your heart. Follow me with all of your heart. You know what I think is so cool about this passage of Scripture is Jesus doesn't tell Peter, Hey, Peter, hey, bring it in tight. This time you can't deny me again. He doesn't say, Peter, bring it in. Are you sure that you won't leave me this time? He doesn't say, Peter, I want you to shake my hand. I want you to sign a commitment form that you won't deny me or leave me or walk away from me ever again. He doesn't even ask him, Peter, are you sure you're ready? The three questions he asked him are this. Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Why? I think Jesus knew that true love equals true devotion. And that kind of love equals a devotion that will lead us to follow anywhere, anytime, any place, through anything. Not long ago, I, I get to do some chaplain work for Indy football, and I was, I was down there, and they had a guest speaker. It was a Navy SEAL who came in to speak to the team, and he was challenging them and encouraging them, and uh, he asked them this question. I, I'll never forget. He, he said this before that. He said, love is the most powerful driving force that you can have in this world. He didn't say honor. He didn't say commitment. He didn't say brother. He said love, and he said, let me ask you guys this question. He said, if, if I said, hey, who wants to stand up and try to fight me just so that they, say, they can say they beat up a Navy SEAL, how many of you would do it? And a couple of them jokingly raised their hands, but they weren't serious. 
And then he said this. He said, but if I were to take your mom or someone you love and put them behind me, how many of you would try to fight me to get to them? The whole room raised their hands. Why? Because when you truly love something, you'll go through anything that's in your way to get to it. And you won't care how crazy you look. You don't care if you're alone. You won't care if you get beat up. You won't care if you die. You'll run and try to get to it. That's why Jesus is asking that question. I'll share one last story with you, and then I'm done. I shared this with our students. Um, I don't think I've shared it in here. I threw it in for free last service. So I'll throw it in for free again here today. I ain't have it in my notes, but... Um, you know, Katie and I, you know, I, I wasn't very romantic. I was pretty bad at that. I, I just, I'm more of a Taco Bell and McDonald's kind of guy, you know. And, and so when it, it came time for engagement, I thought, man, I, I got to do something nice. Like, I got to do something big. I got to go all out, and I got to get after it. And so I, I, my uncle had this old barn out back, and, uh, and I can't fix anything. I'm, ter I'm just going to tell you, I'm terrible with wood and all that stuff. And, but for this moment, I said, you know, I'm going to go out here. I'm going to be like Chip Gaines. It's going to be fixer-upper, you know, times two. You know, and I'm going to fix this barn up, and I'm going to break the Internet, right? I mean, they're going to be like putting me on Pinterest and Instagram. They're going to be like, this guy has got it, got it going on. And so I get out there in that barn, and I start working. I'm hanging pallets up and trying to hang flowers, you know, even though i got no idea what I'm doing. And then my uncle gets out there helping. And, uh, man, it was infested with yellow jackets. And uh, no lie. And so I came back one day, and like, he, he's up on the couch with ice on his eye. I'm like, Uncle, what happened? He's like, yellow jackets. I mean, he's just out with ice on his eye. I'm like, goodness gracious. I go in there. They're everywhere. So I just, I decide I'm going to war. Like, I'm declaring war on these jokers. I go to Dollar General. I'm like, give me all the bottles you got, right? And, and I'm going out the line. She's like, you've got a problem. I'm like, yes, but I'm going to win, right? I go back. I mean, I, I went crazy. I, like, I tied my T-shirt on my head, and I ran in there just screaming. I'm like, it's all for love, you know, and I'm spraying and, and, and you know, going after these yellow jackets, trying to knock them down, hitting them with a the broom, you know, going after it. Finally, we get them out of there. We sweep it. We power wash it, hang lights, flowers, all that stuff. And then I, I have it all planned out at dinner. I got my uncle to call me at dinner and say, hey, uh, when it was time for the night to, to propose, uh, and I had him call me and say, hey, I need you to come help me load the boat because uh, we got to fish tomorrow. And so I told her, I said, hey, we got to go load the boat. We got to go help my uncle. You know, we got to fish tomorrow. And she's mad in the moment. You know, like, oh, you always fish. You know, why, why you got to do this? You know, why can't we have one dinner? You know, and I'm like, just wait, just wait. You know, and then we're going and, and uh, we round the corner. And then all of a sudden, like, she sees it all. And I got down on one knee and I just froze. I just opened the box and smiled. Ah, you know, and like, <laughs> marry me? Like, I guess that will explain itself. And, uh, and, and, and so I go through all that. Why, why did I share that story with you this morning? Here's why. In that moment, man, I didn't know how to do fixer upper chip gain stuff. But I was like, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to pressure wash this thing. I, I didn't care how crazy I looked to get yellow jackets out of there, go to Dollar, Dollar General and buy every bottle that I could buy and go in there running around. I didn't care about anything in that moment. Why? Because I loved her and I wanted to do everything I could to make it a special moment. I didn't care what was in front of me. That's why Jesus is saying, do you love me? Do you love me enough to leave everything behind? Do you love me enough to follow wherever I call you? Do you love me enough to give your life for me? Peter, how much do you love me? Because that's going to determine how far you follow me. And I could only imagine. Man, that first campfire, Peter denies him three times. Second campfire, he says, yes, I love you. Yes, I love you. Yes, I love you. You know how Peter died? This is how he died. Later down the road, man, he lived his life for Jesus. He was the rock Jesus built the church on. And then when it came time for him to die, he said, they were going to crucify him. He said, I don't want to die the same way Jesus died because I'm not worthy. Crucify me upside down. And Jesus was hung upside down. I mean, Peter was hung upside down and was crucified in that moment. And I could only imagine as he's hanging upside down on that cross, he's declaring his love for Jesus. And Jesus, I love you. I love you. I love you. To follow you, even to this death, that people would call me crazy for, that people would leave me alone for, that people would say was worthless. But boy, could you imagine the next few hours as Peter takes his last breath on this earth, and moments later, steps into heaven. And him and Jesus come together for the biggest reunion and hug ever. And they both tell each other, I love you, and I love you. Jesus is asking you that question this morning. Do you love me? Do you love him enough to follow him? It's the same invitation from the beginning of time to the end of the time. Follow me. If you would, bow your heads and close your eyes. I'm not going to stretch this out, but maybe in your heart this morning, maybe you've never decided to follow Jesus. 
And this morning, for the very first time, you need to respond to the call that Jesus has given you. Follow me and come and follow him for the very first time. We're going to have some prayer partners down front that can pray with you, talk with you, help you find Jesus. You guys can come on down now. Maybe, uh, maybe others of you in this room today, you just need to simply answer that question. Jesus, how much do I love you? Do I love you enough to follow you wherever, whenever, through anything and everything? Maybe today you simply need prayer for something, something going on in your life. Or maybe today you just simply want to stand and sing and say, Jesus, I've decided to follow you no matter what it costs, no matter how people look at me, no matter what lies ahead. Jesus, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you do. Thank you that you give us the same invitation that you gave Peter. Two words, follow me. God, I pray if someone needs prayer or if someone needs to follow you for the first time, they would walk down today and talk to someone. God, I pray for others of us today that we would decide in our hearts, man, we've decided to follow Jesus through anything and through everything because we love him that much and nothing else truly matters. God, have your way. And in Jesus' name I pray.